Hi, friends. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight, um, or today. My name is Nora Khan, and <laughs> I'm executive director of Project X Foundation, which is, it just feels strange to say this to my friends sitting here, which is a publisher of Extra. It's just a very fancy way of saying that. Um, Extra is a contemporary arts writing journal based in Los Angeles. And the title of this discussion is Extra at 25 Years, Art Criticism and the View from LA. Um, so I'm joined today by Domingo Castillo, Alpesh Patel, and Jean Moreno. Very excited for the three of you to be here. <laughs> this is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm already very excited. <laughs> And I invited the three to join me in discussion about arts writing and sustaining experimental writing over time. And Extra is a journal for folks who have not um, seen the journal. There's a bunch of copies of our fall issue and some archival copies I'll tell you about in a second. But we are a journal of artist writing with a particular focus on the voice of the artist about their own practice. And Extra was founded by artists in 1997. It's maintained by artists. And the journals featured a number of incredible voices of writers and editors right at the cusp of a big break in their careers. And we have an editorial board of about uh, now 10 editors uh, who are also teachers and professors and curators based in Los Angeles who spend months and months on every essay to develop the work through many drafts. Um, but for folks who are in publishing, this wouldn't be anything new. Um, a lot of the work that happens in the journal um, happens before the piece comes in. And uh, I found I'm only nine months into this role, so my, only, my main access to Extra is through the archive and through reading past essays and past pieces. And what I've been really struck by and what we might focus on today is the way that editors and uh, an arts organization can recognize unusual arguments, unusual styles of writing, um, styles that are less a hardcore review and a style of writing that more moves with the work and moves with an artist's practice. And because we're reaching our 25th anniversary this year, we've been really trying to think about how to maintain that practice over time and how do you make uh, sustainable practice of supporting experimental thinking and experimental artist writing and how how to maintain it is very much maybe on your minds as well. Um, so I, we hope to today like invite all of, all of you here to reflect on writing rooted in place, whether it's in Los Angeles or in Miami or in the local. Extra also has a focus, and I'll start just going through some of the slides. Um, this is 24-1, this is our first issue this year, and this is our fall issue, which, you'll, which you can page through after. We have a real focus on artists and writers of color and LGBTQIA writers in Los Angeles and beyond. And we're really spending a lot of time this year thinking about the work of maintaining a practice and also thinking about the entry points into arts criticism, which can be a very opaque, uh, difficult to navigate and difficult to enter field. So we're really proud of our fall issue, 24-2, which fo uh, features Ron Athey on the cover. And we have, here's a brief preview of, like, of the table of contents. We have an essay on the API uh, Sex Workers Coalition, which is a really stunning review of the archive of API Sex Workers papers and letters, which featured uh, human resources in Los Angeles last fall an essay by David Weltius on the Guernica cap tapestry. Uh, Mariana Fernandez wrote on Galapuris Kim. These are all LA-based artists. I'm just gonna page through some of the, the images. Um, a piece by Jari Das on Kumasi, Ghana-based artistic research residency uh, that's led by craziness artist. It's a beautiful, beautiful long-form essay. I'm showing some images from these pieces too. An artist project by Johan Mihail, uh, an anarchist manifesto, transplanting anal poetics and vegetal love. I can't get over how fun that is to say, which is also a, um, it's also translated by uh, Manuel Rue into Spanish. So it's a really beautiful translation. 
There's a piece on the cover artist, Ron Athey, by April Baca, called Erotic Fungibility of uh, Ron Athey. And then the piece on the API Artist and Sex Worker Collection. So these pieces take many months to develop. Um, the artist projects take over a year to develop. And as the journal started as an artist project, it in many ways continues that ethos. So the editors uh, and everyone involved at Extra take as long as it takes for the work to come to its final, um, its final form and go through iterations. And in the spirit of like, a lot of artistic research, editors take in influences that they find along the way to develop the works. Another thing we'll, I wanted to just share is just a bit of the archive, and we have some archival issues um, that I've brought with me. And in going back through the pieces from 97 to the present, I find a lot of just incredible pieces, like Patty Chang's first uh, review out of her MFA program, early essays by uh, Jack Halberstam, uh, Arya Dean's first long-form essays, which were published in Extra, uh, Ioana Hedva, who's an amazing writer who wrote this, uh, one of my favorite books called On Hell. And she had her first artist residency at 28, through, uh, 28 years old through Extra. And just looking back through the archive, what I'm struck by is the willingness of the editors at Extra to take a chance on weird writing, um, take chances on writings that don't fit well within a genre. And I guess one of the main questions I want to talk through with the three of you today is how do we, how do you develop a practice of supporting interesting writing and ideas? How do you recognize it? How do you as a writer, curator, uh, arts worker get invested in sustaining an environment for, for strange writing as well as visual art? Sounds good? <laughs> okay. So I'm joined by, I want to give a formal introduction to uh, three brilliant individuals, uh, Alpesh, Domingo, and Jean. I admired all three of you for a really long time. Deep practices, all three as writers, as arts organizers, as uh, spiky critical thinkers, uh, who I really feel strongly capture um, my experience of living in Miami. You made those strong, one of some of the strongest impressions. I mean, while here, Alpesh, we're just meeting now, and you, but you've written for Extra, so I actually got to know you through your voice first. And I feel like the three of you um, through your work and practice really embodies like roving critical eye, uh, embodied kind of feeling of criticality and a real openness to experimentation. So I thought you'd be perfect to, to join me today. Uh, so Alpesh Patel, I'm gonna start in the middle, is an associate professor of contemporary art at Tyler School of Art and Architecture. And prior to joining uh, the Tyler School of Art, he was based at Florida International University for almost a decade. His art criticism, art historical scholarship, and curatorial work reflect his queer, anti-racist, and transnational approach to contemporary art. Jean Marina is a director of the Art and Research Center at ICA Miami, and he's also co-director of NAME Publications. And Domingo Castillo is an artist who often works collaboratively to produce artwork and films. And in 2010, the end spring break, a nomadic pedagogical artist-run project in Miami, Florida, was co-founded with Patricia Hernandez and done in collaboration with Catherine Marks and Christina Farrar. In 2013, the gallery no Noguchi Britton, FK Gucci Vuitton, and Versace 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 was, <laughs> was co-founded with L'Oreal uh, Beltran and Aramis Gutierrez. In 2016, Public Displays of Professionalism, PDP, a transdisciplinary think tank was co-founded with Patricia Margarita Hernandez and Natalia Zulaga. I miss Natalia. So thank you again so much for joining me today. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. We only have 35 minutes. I'm gonna flip through some more images of the archive. So I just thought of splitting this 35, 40 minutes into three parts. The first being just to think more broadly about the evolution of artists writing over time. And I thought this could just lay a little bit of groundwork between the four of us. Um, in thinking about how the definition of criticism changes over time, as artists writing as a style that you can trace through the archive, 
how can we understand the evolution of arts criticism as it holds a lot of different styles past the review? And maybe in thinking about this range of styles, um, maybe we could get to why arts criticism and arts writing is important. Oh, yeah, maybe something we all already share inherently, but to articulate it together. And what can arts writing do that can't happen elsewhere? And I'll just very briefly show three pieces that I looked at in Extra that highlight three different styles that we publish, which is um, the hybrid, the personal memoir, critical analysis style, um, an ekphrastic or joyous style, and then the artist writing about their own work. So I found this piece in 2000, uh, an issue from 2002 by Lorraine O'Grady, looking at the South African artist William Kentridge's re uh, retrospective that he had at LACMA in 2002. And what was curious is instead of starting as a straightforward review, uh, O'Grady starts with her memories of meeting the US ambassador to South Africa when she was 10 years old. And mo much of the essay and much of the piece is about her anecdote as a 10 years old, as a 10 year old, meeting the ambassador who made a um, kind of blatantly racist comment to her at 10 years old with, with a lot of, um, with no kind of shame about it. And she writes, I was young and after 10 years of excessively sheltered all female education, just entering the world, still trying to figure out how it worked. The ambassador had confirmed something I earlier only suspected. Once racism has taken up its seat in the soul, it is protected and nurtured by a madness beyond appeal. Not just beyond that of reason, but perhaps more terrifying, beyond the appeal of love. I wondered what would happen to the ambassador's children when they understood this. And then she moves into the review, which starts with guilt. It felt like strangulation, the throat con so constricted that nothing could go down or come up. This was my first point of entry into Kentridge's work. The repetitiveness, the over and overness, the obsessive, futile determination to understand what can never be understood. So it lives in a place not just beyond appeal, but beyond comprehension. So it's a really interesting start to a review of a show, which is first narrative going back into childhood and then slowly starting with this physical, the physical feeling she, she had walking into Kentridge's exhibition. A second piece from 10 years later is an artist project by Harry, Harry Gamboa Jr. Maybe some of you are familiar with his work. And it's a piece um, which first starts out as a seemingly clear, straight, clearly straightforward review. Um, and Alpeshi worked on, Arsh on Arshia Huck's artist project, so you're familiar with this work of describing the artist project and framing it. But it's interesting, you, you have like a very straightforward line, the work draws from the spectacle of US and Mexican mass culture, at the same time hovering between their somewhat different views about death and violence. And then, in the United States, the dead are resurrected as celebrity zombies, Elvis is cited in a Safeway grocery, grocery store, and JFK's brain continues to lead our nation from an underground bunker. And then it goes back into the conclusion about the show. And in a piece from last year, and then I'm gonna to turn to the three of you, sorry to have this long runway. It's a more recent review of Ben Sakaguchi's blistering work on um, anti-Asian violence in Los Angeles by uh, writer Andy Campbell, who's a Caucasian writer, and who brings themselves in to the middle of the review and sort of shakes the viewer and argues for writing, I would say, as an embodied, as felt in the moment. So I'll just read a couple of lines. While typing out the descriptions above, I too feel the heat rising in my cheeks, water cresting my lower eyelids, hair standing on end. I'm continually coming to terms with the complicity required to retell these stories as an art critic attempting to do justice to their deep and wounding effects. And I imagine you might go through something similar when reading my descriptions here, but I'm not sure. So the point I, in laying out these 20 years of different styles is I'm really thinking a lot for our first question about how arts writing and arts criticism shifts over time. And what I've noticed in a lot of um, 
and looking at the course of Exeter's writing and publishing is how the writing has become even more personal, even more embodied with time. Even as O'Grady's was quite personal, um, the style and the critique and the presence of the self has shifted with social shifts, with political shifts, and writing like art you know, captures the spirit of, of a time. So I would love to invite the three of you um, to maybe share a bit how your experience as writers and as arts writers has changed since you've begun as a writer, whether that's in Miami or elsewhere, um, given how publishing is distributed, given a changing arts landscape, uh, and love or animosity for, for criticality. So just like a little reflection, maybe you could also share a bit about your writing and your style and how it's changed over time. Who'd like to start? Right, Domingo? Start. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> So I guess my whole practice with writing really begun around 2010, 2000, yeah, probably 2010, 2011, and it would start in an interview format. So I was, I was being interviewed by people, and then I used that as a platform to kind of work through ideas and writing. Um, and I think I'm, gonna, I'm now shifting back towards that because it's much more generous in terms of the movement of ideas. But then after that, um, I really became interested in kind of telling a story of place and then also kind of like not only critically analyzing artwork, but critically analyzing where it stands in Miami and what that means. Because I feel like a lot of criticism um, doesn't talk about kind of like the all these little functions that the art world does and like what institutions turn into or what different institutions do. Um, and, and how they try to kind of like give artwork um, kind of like a presence. And it's funny, I did these two reviews for Flash Art that were really panning two exhibitions. One was Dara Friedman's exhibition at PAM um, because it, it, it actually displayed how little creatively she had explored, right? It almost became like, oh, you figured out something that worked and now you repeat to see what happens, but kind of like in, yeah, because it was like a, like a structuralist filmmaking, but then really it just kind of was undoing itself the more you saw it in a way that was not helpful for the work, and I brought that out. And it was really like strikingly different from all the other reviews, right? So, and then the other one was a Diamond Stingley exhibition at ICA where I was, I'm really interested in Diamond's work and I've been following it, but then I, something happened at the ICA where it, it fell flat because the ICA is a, operates as a different kind of kind of institution for vilifying an object or just kind of making this object valuable. So it felt like, oh, you're trying to make these objects valuable, but there's no critical engagement with your practice here. It's almost like this is where the kind of market meets where it's just like these are the objects that can sell and move and that was also like that never shows up <laughs> it's only like in print but anytime you kind of look for diamonds work or even looking at things about that exhibition it just kind of disappears yeah. um but i found it interesting especially because like the way that these institutions operate in this city is very different than how institutions operate in the rest of the country so yeah and then i guess that's like a development of style, I guess. Yeah, yeah. that's super nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, what I was thinking about when I first I started writing what is, uh, I, I guess, characterizes art criticism, that is to say, um, uh, short reviews in magazines like Art in America or Hyperallergic, um, I, I didn't really see myself in a lot of what was being written. And that's because I had a misconception of what I think an art critic is supposed to be. I think I had this idea that it was about tearing someone down, that it was about sort of a mean-spiritedness, and it can be about that, for sure. Um, but that really didn't kind of um, uh, mesh with my personality and, and the, the way in which I think I approach engaging with, with artwork. So when I began to understand that um, you can be critical um, and affirmative at the same time, 
um, it became a different game for me. Like all of a sudden it was about championing artists and, and talking about what was passionate about me and seeing that um, as being just as valuable um, as the, uh, the dressing down and the tearing down that occurs too. No. No, I, I identify with that a lot and we can talk about how we like entered the field. I always feel like I entered art criticism by accident. It's just the place that's the container for some kind of joyous writing, some sort of attempt to figure out what a work is about. And I, although that said, I think there's less room for the takedown review. I think a lot of writers are afraid to write <laughs> takedowns because we're implicated in a large system where we're dependent on some people for funding. Um, that said, I think what you're getting to is how the idea of like criticism also is expanded and there are different modes of criticality. Jean? Yeah, so, um, so I don't know. I have, how do you build a voice? And I think, um, I would say for me, it had three, three kind of tributaries. One is method methodological, right? So it's this kind of um, Marxist social art history is what I do. I just think that those texts are insufferable. <laughs> so therefore, the methodology is that, but the voice had to be come from somewhere else. And I think where I found sources was um, when I was coming of age, whatever that means, um, there was like, this kind of um, this kind of queer writing was coming into the fore. People like Bruce Hanley and Wayne Kostenbaum, and it was like the richness of the text was really important. And the other side was this kind of return of this gonzo journalism through people like Dave Hickey, where they're like, "You learn how to write by writing the review of a record." in 250 words. If you can't convince someone to buy a record in that amount of time, um, your writing is not good. So, it's, it's so, so, so that's how you start to build a voice. But then you're also situated, right? So then what you need to do is once you have those tools, then you kind of lean into the contradictions of the space in which you work. And I think that's, that's where I think I write from or how I write what I write. It's this, um, it's this kind of, yeah, right? Because I think, so very recently I just wrote something with my friend Stephanie Wakefield and we were talking about things like, you know, there's a super big interest in climate change in Miami. And we're wondering how come the art and what the resilience officer, right, what the state says and what the media says it's like literally the same message. So then what are, what are the potentialities of artistic production in that scenario? Well, I think it's to not mimic the state and actually look at the real contradictions because while you, know, you have the scientists telling us that this is gonna happen, you have um, Forbes magazine telling us that we're the hottest city in the country and when the street is flooded on a sunny day, there's people standing outside of Gucci waiting for the latest drop. So this is, this is what I think artistic production and the writing around it can do, is actually lean into all that and really kind of squeeze that for, for what it can juice out, I don't know. <laughs> we can re you can respond too if you'd like. Do you have any responses to Gene? Yeah, I mean, just going back to Nora, what you said earlier too about the um, writing is sort of um, having a, a more of a personal bent um, and uh, getting your your voice out there partially means then um, embedding yourself and and into the contradictions that I think that um, uh, Jean is really pointing out to that that we're, we're we here we are at Nada like we're we're in a system. Um, but we can acknowledge that and at the same time, I think, um, begin to critique it for what it is. Uh, we don't have to pretend that um, uh, we're not in the system. I think that's, um, uh, that, that's where the problem can be. Yes. We'll be like, when we pretend it's not there in, in some way. Um, for, for me, though, what's interesting is those contradictions don't come out in my short art criticism so much. They happen more in my 
longer writing and what is seen as not criticism, but is seen as art historical scholarship that gets peer reviewed. And, um, and, and so this is again about containers as well, like um, where things sit and, and what kind of is seen as criticism what, and what is not in, in some ways is also kind of interesting. No, I'm, I'm curious between what both of you have described and what you were describing earlier is like where did you, do you have a moment when you remember um, that the self needed to be taken out of the review and when were you allowed to put the self back in or the essay or a piece of writing? Was it an editor who allowed, who allowed you to do that? Was it an editor or um, a certain masthead that suggested or encouraged you or encouraged you in the other direction? Do you have any m memories? <laughs> Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm, it's really extremely difficult for me to write. So I work with two editors who are my friends and we constantly are talking back and forth about a lot of things. And I work with them before I even send to an editor. So in that process, you know, my voice comes in and out and back and forth until at one point it's just like, well, you just leave it in. <laughs> or you just take it out and usually, um, yeah, an editor, we don't, again, it's just cut it out or leave it in based on um, how poignant it is, you know? So I think it's always like a collective decision, at least for me, to leave that in, you know? Because um, sometimes things are very emotionally charged and I speak about a lot of other um, kind of like material conditions. And then, you know, that's just like, oh, too much. Let's take that out. <laughs> and I, I, we have a lot of uh, editorial debates on extra side and it's been cropping up a lot recently because a lot of writers and pitches are, uh, and their pitches embed themselves directly in the review. And then there's a more traditional new criticism, older style, where like the critic and the critique is this removed pure space. Um, or, and the critic has some sort of like critical distance. And so we've, there's been a lot of, I've seen a lot more tolerance, I think, and acceptance that the critic putting themselves into the piece is, is very crucial. I was wondering if we can, because you were talking about Miami, we could go to the second part of this discussion, which is view from a place. And I shared a bit of this earlier, um, and it's in the title of this talk. And so something we talk about at Extra a lot is the view from LA, given that our writers are you know, all over the country, all over the world, and we've been trying to capture a sense of what a general style would be, whether that's is a view from LA uh, embrace of experimentation? Is it conceptual art? Is it uh, a willingness for institutional critique? When people think of LA artists, they think of Baldessari or Robert Irwin or Chris Burden. But there's also a, a kind of bit of a rejection of East Coast or New York self-seriousness, which I'm, I'm learning about Los Angeles. Embrace of absurdity and play. Um, and affinity and like interest in theorizing like experiments with art and technology and media, especially. So when I've been going back through the extra archive, when I, uh, you know, search for Los Angeles and landscape or Los Angeles and performance, you get hundreds and hundreds of hits of pieces that have those exact phrases. What is Los Angeles is a big one. A lot of writers like spend time reflecting on what LA is and its scale and vastness. Los Angeles labor and rights, displacement and inequity. Um, and land and ownership and artist rights are all pieces that come up. And so I thought we could talk about what, how criticism and arts writing to you suggest a view from a place. If there's like a style of thinking or writing or debate around art and practice that emerges for the three of you from Miami and how you might think about the view from Miami as expressed by like the type of publishing that comes out. And how do you find place or the city that you're in gives rise to a style? And how do you take that style where you go? Because you've moved from Miami elsewhere now. Either one of you can take. Gene, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I want to go back a little bit. Because yeah. you said, you know, I, you said the self and the writing. And Alpesh says something like, you're within the system so you can criticize it. But I'm kind of interested in, in um, right, I think both of those things presuppose that subjectivity is something that the world still allows to be intact. And I don't think that's the case anymore, right? I think 
the kind of capitalism that we live with actually engraves itself first of all in our subjective in our subjectivities and starts to pulverize them from the beginning so I think it's rather than the self in the writing it's more like this pulverizing subjectivity do some writing and I think that might come from the fact that Miami is a place where you can do that because there's no canons right like you know like you said when LA is so anti New York we're like we're not anti anything you know <laughs> that's not how we function like we don't have these counterparts so then we have this also this weird space where we're like we can do this like there's and there's also no like I don't know, like Domingo's not in the school of someone. So we don't have these lineages either. So we can do a little bit more, of a, I don't know, just not that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm sorry, but then I forgot the real question. The, the, view. the view from Miami. If, if, the pla if a place, or if you feel like in working and writing in Miami has given r rise to your style or gives rise to a kind of style yeah. you can identify or set of styles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I guess I was just thinking a, a couple things about, uh, you know, so, so Roland Barthes writes about how, in his bi biography he writes about how he's his own b blind spot. So when we're talking about bringing ourselves in, it's a construction. It, it's not. It's, it's not really um, ourself. It's a version of, of ourselves. And again, we're our own blind spot. So this, it's, it's strange to kind of think of a style coming out of a place. I don't know if I can answer that, but I, but I can, I can say though, just from my point of view and some of the writing that I've done, it, it is affected by where I live. So I wrote something on um, Adrian Piper's work relating to Trayvon Martin, and uh, you know, Trayvon Martin is from South Florida. He also died in Central Florida, which is where I spent most of my life um, early on. And um, I started to connect the work, those particular situations, to other things like 9-11 and 7-7 that may have nothing to do with um, Trayvon Martin on a, on a surface level, but for me personally, actually quite connected um, those dots. So, you know, I, I think that there's, there, there's ways of, um, uh, of connecting what's, what's taking place in a region to other potential locations. Um, and I'd, I'd rather kind of think of that as a way of ask, answering that question about um, the, the view from Miami. Like it's such, such a personal view. I think all of us are gonna have something very different and maybe the idea of kind of trying to characterize um, a style is, is not a good idea. Like, yeah, I, I have a different I think it, the thing that I've noticed, um, just because I've been active enough to know that certain blogs, there, was, there were blogs that come up where people were just like heavily critical about Miami and the one style that I think does come here and it's very tr like true or two things, it's like a diaristic one that is being developed currently in the past like maybe five, seven years. And then the, the hater style which is just very much just sus of everything and therefore I will be very critical of it because what is, like again, it's a deconstruction of all these systems because they don't work like everywhere else. So it's really hard to kind of like have expectations of how a system should work when they don't function this way here. And I think the writing that I've just like read over the years and other kind of like critics, some anonymous, some not, it's always been that, you know, it's always like understanding that this system is slightly different and therefore hypercritical of itself in a way that, again, it's just like hating, which is a very um, Miami kind of thing. <laughs> I remember a lot of conversations we, we've had over this. I mean, I think there's also like parallels between uh, when I read art criticism and arts writing from Los Angeles and arts criticism from Miami, there's a focus on infrastructure on um, labor on like class inequity on I mean obviously like climate as well like fires in Los Angeles and water here and there's often this like because of the scale of boat cities is more unwieldy it gives way also to this diaristic style too in Los Angeles as well has your writing changed by dint of being here specifically if you imagine yourself writing anywhere else 
I, I honestly can't work or do anything outside of here. It's actually very difficult. It's like this place is such a contradiction. It, it yields so much more um, creativity. Whereas if I go to another place and the public transit works, there's nothing to complain about. <laughs> like, you should come to LA. There's yeah. a lot to complain about there too, for sure. <laughs> So there's a third piece of this conversation I'm going to skip over, um, which is maintenance, and shared a bit about this. Um, I've been really struck, uh, not over the last few days, to see like the presence of a lot of presses, a lot of publishers here. Um, Nada seems to be very welcoming to like independent publishers and critical writing. Uh, Burnaway, I just want to shout out Burnaway, amazing journal from Atlanta, uh, which is here at the fair, and did a beautiful booth with Jay Payton, which I got to include on a tour yesterday. Um, there, uh, I think Patty Johnson, the critic, was running, was leading a run on the beach here through Nada. Topical Cream has had a panel here as well, and it just feels like a, a space where you can consider arts writing, arts criticism as a way to like close read together or develop a language together about difficult work. But you know, as a publisher, like arts writing mean, is very hard. <laughs> it's very difficult to keep up like, uh, and sustain and maintain fragile, hard to define practices um, and make and argue for it being as important as the works that are on display. So I'm curious from all of your individual experiences as publishers, as writers, um, how do you see what, what strategies have you learned about cultivating a space for writing and sustaining it over time? I mean, the money piece is one, one part of it, but any, any kind of insights from your practices over the last 10 years? Maybe with name, we could start with name. So, yeah, so name started as um, a bit of a project. It was a space to open up space for Miami artists, in the background, there was an interest in thinking about standardization and global flows and all these things. And it slowly morphed into a different kind of project. So now it's a bit two-sided where we kind of do work with institutions who don't want to do books. So we kind of do editorial work for them. And we do a little bit of kind of archiving the city, trying to think of what has happened here and is about to be lost. Um, so we have two kind of big archival projects. One is on uh, Cuban performance art of the 1980s, which it's, it's literally at this point just a bunch of documents that are going yellow in people's drawers because there's no institution, right? There's no, you know, the way these things are, are maintained is because there's an, ins a ter an institution in a territory that values that cultural material and they care for it. And there's no institution in the territory where this material is produced that cares for it. In fact, they would wish it to go away. So it's just dispersed. So it's a way of collecting this. Um, you know, we call this migrant archives, but it's actually like the archives of migrants. Um, and the other one is around a painter called Enrique Castro Cid, who worked here in the 70s and 80s. And uh, no one cared for a long time. Until I guess, I mean, Domingo's kind of looked into him a bit too. So at, until, you know, two generations down, someone cared. Um, so yeah, so that's what's become of, yeah. of that space. Do you, do you find uh, criticism writing is a place where not only are the like archives elevated, but a uh, frame or like an entry point for the general public can be built? Is that how you've moved your critical practice? It, it, it sounds a bit like that, but... I think, I think there's, what happens is these are kind of very precarious spaces. So you'll have something, I mean, after the Herald kind of gave up on art writing, right? There's kind of historical writers like Helen Cohen, who, you know, is a figure. Um, and the weeklies did it for a long time, kind of took the mantle and were kind of active and every week. And then after all that went away, it's just these very precarious situations appear. Um, you know, there was the Miami Rail for a while, and that faded. Then there was a, like a blog movement for a while. That seems to have faded a little bit. Um, so it, it's always been a space that all these outlets are very precarious. And art writers are actually really forced 
to kind of find places out of here in which to deposit their writing. And that is, I think that's been the constant, at least since I started writing. We had to do that work and, you know, yeah, find people who would let us tell them about the things we saw. <laughs> Thank you. Alpesh and Domingo. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, first name is so important, I think, and, and uh, so thankful that um, Gina and Natalia really um, uh, put that together and it's still thriving. And, you know, you mentioned Extra has been around for 25 years. And as Gene said with, with Miami Rail, these, they, they haven't been around that amount of time, like 25 years. So um, it's, you know, we, we, that would be wonderful if we could get to that kind of point. I mean, I think name for sure will get to, get to that point. But from, from my point of view as an educator, being at FIU, my thing was like, okay, so we need an art writing class, right? We, we need to have a class on art writing to at, at least um, um, allow a, a younger group of people to understand what it even means to, to write about art, to how to engage with language. Um, what it means um, to use language not as just description, but as a way of, of research and thinking. And so uh, for many years, uh, Don Chan, who was an editor of, of mine, um, uh, and who's now a bard, she taught an online class on art criticism. And it was an experiment at first. We had it for, I think, about a year or two, and the reviews were really good. So we kept it. and and. Um, um, I taught it once, it's, I don't know where it is now, but I really felt like that class was so important. Even if people didn't go out of that becoming art professionals, that wasn't really the point, but, but that they were exposed to what it means to write an artist interview. You know, just these kind of really uh, things that we think are self-evident, but, but maybe aren't, and giving people a chance to um, approach those ideas um, in school felt super important. So. Um, that, that's sort of one way in which I feel like I was attempting to at least bring this into Miami in some capacity. Yeah. And, and right before you speak, Domingo, I mean, I want to come back to this, to how, like as a teacher as well, um, where there is no model or there is no path for how to actually become a writer, one, to make it sustainable, do it past a certain amount of time when you feel like you're burning out and then like resustain, keep finding the energy for it. I want to hear how each of you finds <laughs> the energy to go on and push forward. And maybe we could close with that, but then let's have Domingo speak first. Yeah, you, so. You two can think about that. I mean, it's funny. So having a gallery and working with Natalia and Patricia like criticism and arts writing actually just turned into just doing exhibitions and writing a press release and writing a critical essay for the exhibition, kind of like all these introductions, kind of like um, weaving all these ideas together through programs and just like more, again, just like more of a didactic um, praxis of, of criticism rather than publishing. Because I felt like the forms of praxis are actually just as valid as publishing. I mean, this is a recording, therefore there's a transcript, therefore it can continue. Um, so, so yeah, cause all the writing I did, I, I just started getting tapped. Like people would just message me like, could you review this? Sometimes I would say yes, sometimes no. And also just depends on how much time I have. Cause it's like such an arduous task to write that if it's just like you have a two week turnaround, I'm just like, I can't help you. <laughs> um, yeah. And at the time and the effort, um, I wanted, I, this is one of the last slides I wanted to share. That's something we've been thinking about at Extra a ton is like you need to sustain a person over a year's time with a number group of editors. And so we have uh, Extra has an editorial fellowship that we just started this year where um, someone who is on the cusp of needing that extra time, that one year with a group of editors is a bunch of people apply to this fellowship and then they're supported with uh, 12k for the year to work on one piece which is really that is how much time that it yeah. takes to, to do one piece it's a huge investment for us but I think that is something that I've been thinking about a lot is where do you get the model to sustain and keep up the work of editing drafts and time because uh, it's certainly not paid like the, the energy and time is not compensated so what are the other places of support 
Maybe we could end before we open uh, things up to questions. I hope folks do have questions. Um, how, what kind of models have you found personally and collectively to argue for criticism as a practice? And to, and to maintain it? I mean, I have, I, I have a group of friends that I basically just like talk shit with all the time. Perfect. That's it. That just <laughs> maintains it. And sometimes it's just like, hey, you should write about this. It's like, okay, cool. And then you just figure it out and find it and that kind of thing. I, mean, yeah. I, do, I do agree with Domingo. Like when you said earlier, you had two people that you work with and uh, you, you, need, you need people <laughs> you need, <laughs> yeah. around you yes. that you can talk to freely about. And, there's, yes. and there's, you don't need a lot of people. You need one or two people maybe, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, but, but those people are crucial because otherwise it's a very solitary kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Being an artist, being a writer, these are, um, you spend a lot of time by yourself. Right? Yeah. So, but you, you need those moments where you can check in with uh, someone yeah, who yeah. you trust um, and they'll keep you going. Right? Or they'll, you know, they'll, <laughs> they'll tell you what you're doing wrong, which you also need to know. Yeah. But yeah, you need a perspective. Someone yeah. who's willing to tell you like when you're going wrong or, yeah. Mm. You were about to say something. Yeah, I was going to say it's just like a very collective process. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that the model at the end of the day is just like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I've done writing, but this is just like a, I'm a representation of a collective of people yeah. kind of speaking. I'm speaking with. Yeah. Yes. Beautifully said. Jean? Oh, I don't have models. I think the, <laughs> the spiraling out is the model <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just write that out and the writing sometimes gets done sometimes it sits in a draft forever yeah i really like i uh, kind of coming to a close on this point of like criticism as like a collective act because i've only thought of writing and writing about art as a way to find other people who are maybe thinking the same questions and maybe searching for the language for something in between and it's just a way to like find others and maybe the reviewer essay is good maybe it isn't but we're we're here in this stage which is really lovely maybe have some questions from folks pastiche hi I can. I felt something similar this year too. There was an exhibition at the Lowe Museum about like uh, like Cuban American artists in the '80s, um, and I really wanted to write about it. I just had no time because, again, it just like it at least I I at least need a month to five weeks, which is also extremely luxurious to be able to write to something about something when everything's very fast paced. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's so many things that just go by the wayside. I also like this idea that a friend of mine was doing where he is choosing to write film reviews now of films that went on a long time ago and kind of like deal with that, right? Because it's like, I'm going to write a review of this movie. This movie's crazy. Um, but I think the same with these exhibitions because they, again, they just like exist in the mind after or they exist yeah. in these images. And like this whole experience is just kind of like, 
gone, but there's still something to be pulled from it. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know, again, like that's a space that doesn't exist for writing, you know, that could exist, um, especially here, because everything feels really amnesic. Things don't last here very long, so, mm -hmm. you know, what people see now isn't the city that existed five years ago, isn't the city that existed 10 years ago. So it's really hard to understand that this place when that's inaccessible, you know? So, yeah, I don't, I've, I've also, I'm really terrible. I don't pitch to anyone because I don't feel like I can deliver. Mm. Like I just have a very slow process until I get so agitated and I get asked and I'm like, yeah, I'm angry, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> We have something, Pestige, maybe to even give a little bit from like the extra side. Um, we've been talking a lot about the blind spots of our collective. Like, not every editor goes out and sees every show. So, I'm, you know, you can get into like kind of a routine of seeing the same people in the same kinds of venues. And so, uh, one thing I've admired is that the editors are always arguing with each other and making an argument for. So if no one had gone and seen that show, they will write a two-page, or a, a, sorry, a two-paragraph like kind of rhetorical argument for why the show is important and why we need to find someone to review it like right now. And so they're so escalating that urgency to like kind of work against that amnesia is something we discuss a lot. Um, or one thing I've come to is like I don't have time to as much time to write anymore, so I will just send my pitches to other writers and say just use this and pitch, I'll just, you can write it. Uh, you actually have the time to write and you can do it well. And so I've been finding that a lot more as I'm moving along is that someone should write about this piece and it's urgent and here's, and then just give it to someone else and not have that kind of like selfish ownership over it. Oh my God, there's one more thing I forgot to add. Um, a lot of the arts writers here are also artists and sometimes we're also in the show. So then it's just like, like Monica's here, exactly. It's just like, I do feel like in, in the long game of art history that I'm often in that things that I wanted to write about that um, an editor wouldn't publish like this article about these horrible kind of uh, racist depictions that were that a white Polish artist <laughs> was making that I wanted to really take down actually um, you know it, it found its way into something else later but like five years later so it took <laughs> a while I don't know if everyone has, can wait that long but I, I found that if I'm compelled enough, um, it will come up later in something else. <laughs> so, so there's there's a way that um, it will uh, it, it can make a life if if you want to. But I can't do that with everything. There are some things that I wanted to write about. It didn't, um, you know. There was a no, and then I'm just like I don't have time to 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 pitch this and to to really fight for it. Like um, you have to choose your battles, and and so often that means many things don't get. Um, done either. Yeah. Thank you both. Jean, do you have anything that you want to say? No, okay. no, that's great. Yeah. Thank you both. <laughs> um, time for a couple more questions, I think. I know they're burning questions in the audience. Lauren? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Really nice. So, uh, I just want to re-say the question to see if I understood it correctly. So you're saying that 
there's art writing in institutional spaces, and then more local voices. How, how do more local voices enter that space? So whether institutional writing can be a form of criticism, like of collective critique, rather than like an institutional voice, is there? Yes. Uh, is that I'm still not totally clear on the question, but what I can say is that. So um, when I've worked on catalog, so I think one of the things, some of the stuff that we talked about, where there's kind of, is kind of these precarious structures that, you know, don't generate um, critical amounts of writers, then when you're kind of building an institutional program of some sort, then you kind of don't necessarily have a pool of art writers and you have to go elsewhere. So like when I do catalogs, you know, I work with folks like Jafari Allen, who's an anthropologist at UM, or Erica James, who's like a straight art historian rather than a critic. So then there's also a bit of a, of a, of a lacuna sometimes of voices that as, as an institution, then you have to go find those voices outside of art writing with people who are, you know, adjacent to art writing and interested in art and ask them to engage art objects. So, so I don't think that was where you, but it's what you made me think about or something. <laughs> I'll push. <laughs> Uh, nothing more to nothing more to add to to that. I think. Interesting. Thanks, Lauren. We can talk about this after too. <laughs> Any final questions? No. Well, um, I before we close, I just wanted to note that in addition to twenty four two our fall issue of Extra. Um, thanks to Megan Gordon, who's here in the audience, who's the director of Ochi Projects in Los Angeles, and is also on our board at Project X Foundation, made this panel possible, made the tour po yesterday possible, brought us here to Miami, so thank you very much, Megan. <laughs> um, Megan also helped us bring down two very special prints, which we have available by Monica Maholi and Hannah Herr, who are two incredible artists living and working in Los Angeles. And this first piece, uh, Blue Boy introduces Roger as part of Maholi's Blue Boy series, which she's been working on since 2015, uh, looking at Blue Boys, which is uh, one of the earliest national uh, gay magazines founded by Donald Enbinder and based here in Florida and published from 1974 to 2007. And so Maholi has uh, created this print for us. And the second piece is by Hannah Herr, Moonbather, which is in response to Maholi's work. And Monica pulled Hannah's drawings and asked her to create a print for us, um, which was done with uh, El Nopal Press. And so both of these pieces are uh, in museums and are beautiful works and are also selling for half of what they are worth. So I would take a look at them if you'd like to support extra, like to support independent criticism and writing and you enjoyed this conversation today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Domingo, Alpesh, and Jean for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.